then before we go over to our next guest, we have a short video by one of our professors here at Erasmus School of History, Culture and Communication, who is currently a visiting researcher in Florence, Gijsbert Oonk. Just before he left, however, we asked him to reflect on the question, who are we actually cheering on at the World Cup? You may become member of a sport club or a political party. You can become member of a student society, but you cannot become a member of the state that you wish. <laughs> Who are you cheering on at the World Cup in Qatar? Now, in order to answer this question, we need to clarify two things. One, what is your team? Who is in your team and what do they represent precisely? And two, and I will start with that, who are you? What's your identity? Because usually people tend to think that these two are related to each other. My wild guess is that most people in this audience, or at least in the Netherlands, will cheer for the Dutch national team during the upcoming World Cup in Qatar. You will sing the national hymn. Wilhelmus van Nassau. You will raise the flag, the red, white, and blue. And maybe you even wear orange. But why? Why do you support the Dutch and not the Belgium team, for example? You may say, I'm born in the Netherlands, or I hold Dutch citizenship. But that's only by accident, is it? It's just that your parents are born here, or you happen to have a Dutch passport. That's not a real nor a rational choice. In fact, you don't even have a choice. We may have many freedoms, but acquiring citizenship is not one of them. You may become a member of a sport club or a political party, you can become a member of a student society, but you cannot become a member of any state that you wish. Most countries do not allow you to become a member. They restrict membership. So for most of us, your membership by the Dutch state only accidentally happened. In other words, citizenship is forced upon us and it limits your options to become a citizen of another country. In fact, it limits your rationality. If you were rational, you would cheer for Brazil. They most probably will become the next world champion. Now, if you think it's only natural that I support the Dutch, the Dutch government, the Dutch schooling system, and the Dutch media did an excellent job in brainwashing you. They let you think that's natural. But let me show you that it's just the result of a bunch of accidental facts in the past. Why does the Dutch national team wear orange shirts during World Cups? Why do the Dutch fans wear orange? So some people will say this has to do with Willem van Oranje Nassau, who in the 16th century was the founding father of the nation. That's correct. Orange symbolizes national unity and the Dutch signifies national pride by wearing orange. But what the fuck? He was not born in the Netherlands. He was born in what is now Germany. And the orange refers to him indeed but that is because he accidentally inherited an estate in southern France called Orange. So would he cheer for the Netherlands or would he have preferred the German team or the French team or maybe Belgium as he lived part of his life in Brussels? Given the importance of Willem of Orange to the Netherlands, you may wonder why the Dutch flag, flag is not orange or at least partly orange. Orange used to be a part of the Dutch flag in the early years of existence of the Netherlands, when the Dutch flag was orange, white, and blue. Red replacing orange in the Dutch flag was a sign of the political dissociation between the House of Orange and the new Dutch Republic. So even the House of Orange was not always in line with the Dutch Republic. So why should you? How would the World Cup look like if you, the Dutch, had not been separated from Belgium? As we know, at the Congress of Vienna in 1815, the Southern Netherlands, Belgium, and the Northern Netherlands, Holland, were united. But in 1830, as a result of some uprisings, they, the two states became independent. If that had not happened, 
the Dutch could have played with Belgian players like Kevin De Bruyne and Lukaku, and they might even have a chance against the Brazilians. So now take a short look at the first question. Who is the team that you support? In our Sport and Nation research, we have, looked, we have looked at the number of players that play for a country in which they are not born. Now, four years back, you might remember, the Dutch did not qualify. But there were seven players active in the World Cup that were born in the Netherlands. Five players would represent Morocco, and many, especially Moroccan Dutch fans, supported the Moroccan team. Two players were born in Haarlem, represented Nigeria. They did not build a large fan base. And the other Dutch fans, well, maybe they supported Belgium. Now let's go back to the Moroccan team. Five were born in the Netherlands. Eight were born in France. The sum of the French Moroccan fans would support Morocco as well. Only six were born in Morocco. And others were born in Belgium, Spain and Canada. Now what was the language in which they communicated? Most play players did not speak Arabic. The Dutch Moroccan players could not speak French, and the French Moroccan players did not speak Dutch. Thus, the language in which they communicated was English. Mind you, this is the Moroccan national team, and no one was born in the UK. Let's take a look at the current world champions, France. Except for three players, all were born in France. But most players could trace their ancestry to other countries, including Guadeloupe, Congo, Senegal, Ghana, Angola, Haiti, Martinique. Some commentators argued that not France, but migrants had won the World Cup. Or that not France, but Africa had won the World Cup. It at least raised the question whether countries with a colonial background, like France, or countries with a strong diaspora network, like Morocco, can make use of a larger talent pool. Qatar, the host of the current World Cup, did not wait for the answer. Within the rules and legislation of offering citizenship and following the rules of FIFA, they have granted 50% of their 26 players in their team Qatari citizenship. So, will this be the future of World Cups? Countries that give citizenship to talented players in order to represent a national team? Or a World Cup where diaspora teams dominate? Or teams with a strong co colonial talent pool, like France or indeed the Netherlands? Whatever your answer is, for me, I will support the Netherlands, especially players that have been active for Feyenoord. I'm brainwashed as well. If that does not work out well, I will consider Belgium or Morocco. But whatever I choose, and whatever you choose, what I have learned from the Sport and Nation project, your nationality is not your fixed identity. Let that sink in. Yeah, that does pose the question, who are we actually cheering for? Uh, what does nation and immigration mean? Are nation-based teams still possible in a globalizing world? And has the World Cup always been such a diverse affair as it is right now? Our next guest can help us in answering these questions. He actually did his PhD under the wing of Gijsbert Oonk and researched migration at the World Cup from the first edition in 1930 until now. He transferred to Utrecht University earlier this year, where he is now Assistant Professor Geography, Youth and Education. Please welcome Gijs van Kampenhout. <applaus> Thomas, who, who did you cheer for uh, last World Cup around? Whew, I, don't, I don't really remember. I think Argentina, because of uh, Lionel Messi. So ra a rational choice, maybe, because they could uh, have made a big chance back then? Um, I don't think I base my choice on, on the chance they made on winning, but I really like Lionel Messi as a player, so I think I was cheering for him. Okay. Gijs, has the World Cup always been this diverse as Gijs Bert just showed us, or has it been different in the past? Well, it has not been that diverse as it is right now, but what we see is nothing new. No, it, there have been players, uh, foreign-born players, as we call them, representing other national teams in the country which they were born, even in the 1930s already. Just to give you an example, in uh, 1913, you had this player, Luis Monti, who was born in Argentina. He represented Argentina in the final. They lost against Uruguay. And four years later, he won the World Cup as an Italian. How, well, did, how did that happen? Yeah, that happened. Well, it's quite like an interesting story, of course, on its own, because he's the only one who 
ever represented two national teams in a World Cup final. Uh, he was born in an Italian family who migrated to Argentina around the 1900s. And after his success in the 1930 World Cup, he transferred to Juventus. And based on his bloodline, he was eligible to become an Italian citizen. And, well, even Mussolini at that time, he was quite... He, he was not keen on using those players, but he saw the advantage of using sports as a um, nationalism binding, uh, binding metaphor. So with Monty in his selections and three other uh, Argentinian team born players, he thought, well, chances of success are higher. And indeed, it turned out to be that case as they won the World Cup. Okay. But afterwards, every Italian player, except for the foreign born players, got a, a replica of the trophy, and they were just thanked, and then basically got out of sight. So they were they were Italian for uh, maybe a month or so, and afterwards they were, well, not really seen as Italian anymore. No, they were, yeah, they were Italian because of the bloodline, and Mussolini was really keen on emphasizing that. They have Italian blood running through their veins, but not Italian enough to celebrate the win, so to say. So Italian when they score, but afterwards it's uh, it's over. In that sense, yeah. is, th is this a, a trend you've seen in your research? Uh, this this distinction between the the, the the true countrymen and the well, the countrymen that sometimes get chosen only for their merits. Well, it, I think I think everywhere is when when their success, when their sporting success, when when teams are winning, um, bonding happens the best. Bonding between people in in, in getting a nation together. Well, it works best when their success. Um, when there's loss or when things do not go out, turn out as planned, or a national team, well, performs under par, under expectations, then we see quite often that certain players are becoming scapegoated. And generally speaking, those are the ones who somehow mismatch the stereotypical uh, ID of who we as a nation are. So in that sense, the Italians, the Argentinian-born Italians, are less Italian, so to speak, um, well, than the true Italians who were born and raised there. As, as, as Gijsbert mentioned in this, in this clip as well, the French players with an African migration background, there became the other in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So this is something we've seen actually in your research in the past in the first World Cup, but we see it nowadays as well. Thomas, is this something you recognize as your, in your work as a coach that uh, sometimes players are seen as heroes and next, the next week they might be, uh, well, attacked? Uh, yeah, it's, I think it's very common. Uh, I, I've been playing in South Africa also and um, uh, there, there are a lot of different cultures in South Africa. And when we were winning, every, the team was one and everybody was talking the same language. Uh, most of them was English, but when we were, we were losing, uh, I think I heard uh, seven different uh, languages within South African players. So then they went back to all their own culture and, uh, and, 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 and spoke badly about the other cultures. So I think it's, it's not only nationwide, but it's also uh, just in between cultures and, 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 and in Holland, I think most of the time it's the same. Yeah. So why has this become such a focal point in the public eye in the past decades? Because of course it has expanded. There's now more players with immigration background, but nowadays they are called out more as well uh, as we've seen in well, with historical examples in the past years. Why do you think so? Um, well, l let me first start with, with, with getting back to the numbers because I did some calculations from the 1930s until now. And we see that especially from the mid 1990s, there's a steadily increase in the percentage of foreign-born players at the World Cup. It's from 10 to 12 percent, and this World Cup, 137 players are foreign-born, which equalizes 16.5 percent of the players are foreign-born at this World Cup. Um, so, although these numbers are increasing, I think it, that's not the most interesting part. It's just that behind that, behind this political, the socio-economic structures in most societies is getting more tense. We're getting debates about who can represent us and who belongs to the us group. And this is, yeah, getting more attention by media and the political debate and it's getting heated and heated. In the, in the Dutch team, we also have one player who played uh, 
uh, games for another country. Yeah. You know which one? Um, which one? Oh, that's a tricky question, of course. I could. Is he currently playing in the Dutch He's team? He's currently okay. playing, yeah. Well, I know from uh, Nathan Arke, but he didn't. I think he just at youth level played as well for the Dutch national team. But he could play for Ivory Coast. Yeah. No, it's Denzel Dumfries. Denzel no, Dumfries. He played yeah, Aruba. For, uh, Aruba. Yeah, yeah, you're right there, yeah. But the interesting part, you, there's one foreign-born player in the Dutch national team. Can you name him? Frimpong? No. I, I, think, I think you mean uh, Luc de Jong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's born in Switzerland. Oh, we're doing this in a football quiz uh, right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you, in your research, you often talk about, you, take, you have an example of Masoud Ozil that you often uh, that's a char use as a, as a, to characterize what you mean. Um, can you explain a little bit about what happened to him and the distinction between well, a moral or legal citizenship, as you have called it? Yeah, well, l let me start with um, every player who, who, par who participates at the World Cup is a formal citizenship of the country he represents. Um, Mesut Özil is a, born in, in Gelsenkirchen, uh, so Germany. He's a third generation migrant with a Turkish background. At the age of 17, he decided, he had to decide which nationality he took on, as Germany law only allows one citizenship. To play, that people should only have one citizenship, so he dropped his Turkish passport. Um, since then, he was quite successful. He became, I think, five times German Player of the Year. He has been captain of the, the, the German national team uh, numerous times, and he's even called this model immigrant in, in German society. But then in uh, the last World Cup 2018, uh, well, he was a bit of fallout, and, well, there was... Two reasons for that, roughly speaking, of course. Uh, the first one, in the run-up to the World Cup, he, with uh, Gundogan, went on the picture with Recep Erdogan, which many Germans did not really like. It was not a good choice for him from their perspective. And the second one, Germany got knocked out in the, in the group phase while they were four years earlier as the world champions. Uh, and you really saw that German public and media saw well, we're looking for a scapegoat, and Ezil was quite an easy target due to his relation with Turkey and the uh, Turkish nation. Even to that degree that he uh, wrote a Twitter statement in English, which is interesting to know that uh, he really he said, I'm German when we win, but I'm an immigrant when we lose. So, yeah, I think that's a really strong point that if you talk about who is part of us, who belongs to us, and who can represent us, that, that's a really fragile thing for people who uh, have dual nationality or are. In a certain way, you can think of um, skin color, you can think of religious background, can be othered from these national stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And Thomas, you've played for uh, well, a lot of Dutch teams. Uh, do you, is this something you've seen in your experience as well? Yeah. Yeah, and, and in the team I'm coaching right now, there's a lot of uh, players uh, with a Moroccan background. And uh, they're quite successful now, but when they're not, uh, they'll always be pointed on the, uh, on the things they don't do very well. And, uh, and, and their culture will always be, uh, uh, be a topic. So, um, uh, yeah, I, th I, I really recognize it. And, and why do you think, why is this, guys? Why, why does this happen? Well, yeah, it, it, it's hard. I mean, you have to be really nuanced here, and, and, and I can't explain that every every uh, little piece and every bit of it. But as long as someone is a bit different than you, I mean, it's always a reflection of yourself. I mean, it is us against them, you against the other. Um, if someone's different differs a bit than you, then it's not you. So if a player who's not totally Dutch, let's keep it that but has a Moroccan background, let's keep it to that example, then you can say, yeah, he's not l truly Dutch because he has his Moroccan roots. So he's still a bit of the other. Mm -hmm. So that might make your loss a bit less heavy or so, I don't know. But so what would be a way to, to, to solve this issue, would say? Because you, you've been someone who's been quite vocal about, well, uh, maybe changing the rules of the game or maybe nationality should be treated differently. What would you, what would you say is a solution to this? Yeah, well... I think using nationality as a way to organize international sports, why shouldn't we get rid of it? 
why do we have it as this? Uh, I mean, guys, but mentioned as well as as national teams can just within the rules of this FIFA game make arrangement with players to give them citizenship and then then compete for them. So why not let it go at all? And well, I don't know how to rearrange it, but it's not too easy to do that, right? I don't know, but but I, what I do know is that. I think the hardest part is because we are used to think about in terms of nation states and states competing against each other. I mean, that's how we are educated. That's how we trained. That's how we think about the world, not only in sports, but outside of, outside of it as well. Um, but as now many more players are perhaps not truly representatives of the nations they are, as we can see, there's an increase in form-born players. But the increase is even larger if you look at players with a migration background. I mean, I would say nearly half of the players could have, could have dual nationality right now. Um, so it is the progress, the progress that's already there. And I think especially FIFA should loosen up their um, eligibility regulations to, have, to give also players with dual nationality more a chance. When now you have to choose at quite a young age if you're talented enough and then you're stuck to that choice. Yeah. They did loosen up a bit the regulations, um, but I think they could loosen up it way more to have the best players at your tournament. But won't we maybe get then what the, the Qatari team is right now that Gijsberg just mentioned, that they just you know fly in players and convert their citizenship and then you have a team? Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not ho totally in line with Gijsberg in this case, because um, the Qatari team right now only has 10 foreign-born players, and most of them... Uh, have been living in Qatar for quite a while because of their parents' moves to Qatar. And you have to keep in mind that Qatar is a, is a country of, of immigration. I think 90% of the citizens of Qatar are not born in the country. So, yeah, well, then it makes hard. Then if you should take the 10% only to make out the team of that 10% of the people. And there were 3 million, so that's... <laughs> okay. But it, it's, it's nice that there's a system in which money isn't really decisive on... And what team the best players are? are no, playing. but something more powerful is decided, and that's citizenship. Yeah. And if countries are stretching their own national regulations on citizenship, so it's get easier to get, for example, let's say Dutch citizenship, then you can get Korean citizenship. Well, then then the Dutch can quite easily and more easily actively, because that's what what's happening right now, actively look out for the best players within these regulations. And Gijsbert mentions the diaspora teams of uh, Morocco, uh, Tunisia, Senegal. At the moment, those are the teams have with the most foreign-born players because they're actively on the lookout for the best players who can fit in their diaspora and through the, uh, the blood band of their parents and great-grandparents, yeah. they get selected. Well, yeah, I, I've, I've heard stories about players who... Uh, the, I, I thought it was the Nigerian... Uh, the, the Nigerian Football Association, who thought their uh, of a player, his parents were Nigerian or his granddad, something like that, and they were reaching out for him to play, uh, but that wasn't even the case. And still, they said, "Well, it's fine. You get a Nigerian passport, and we let you play." Yeah. So th yeah, that's that's what's happening right now. Yeah, and that's also been happening since the 1980s, for example, with the uh, Irish team. They've been doing that as well. So would your, your rules, proposed rule change so help to solve this problem or? I don't know if it solves the problem I and mean, I don't see this as a problem. I would not, would not frame this as a problem, but I would say open it up, loosen it up, make it more transparent how, how things are going. Um, and then I think in the end, people will choose who they cheer for based on well, gut feeling. Because as Gijsbeer said, it's just a coincidence, or you can say a lottery uh, where you were born and which passport you have and which nationality and therefore you you have so make it open okay make it transparent so uh my last question to you if the netherlands get kicked out who will you cheer for uh well if if i watch because I'm, I'm a bit on team sandra in this case um you can call me during the final yeah uh, i will <laughs> um well i don't know if i really cheer for our team but one of the interesting matches that's coming up is, for me, is Morocco versus Belgium, which I really look forward to see. Uh, well, this this is this really a mix of very various nationalities in there. Okay. Well, uh, please, one more applause for Gijs van Kampa. Thank you so much.